Okay, so midway through chapter five, remember we are mid-conversation with Aunt Gloria. Aunt Gloria has just recorded her television interview or her television appeal to try and get public support to try and find Salim. And she's just asked Ted if she did okay. So, yes, Aunt Gloria, I said. Do you think somebody out there might hear, might help? It's a possibility, I said. What do you think, Ted? Do you think Salim is all right? Hmm, I said. What does that mean? She said. Her face took on its mini Ice Age look. I was just thinking, Aunt Gloria. The mini Ice Age thawed. She sighed. Her hand went out and landed on my head. She ruffled my hair the way Mum does. I squirmed. Aunt Gloria didn't notice. You know, Ted, I'm sick to my stomach. I stared at her stomach in confusion. At least you're honest, she said. Everyone keeps telling me he's okay. Yeah, sure, he's fine. It will all work out. He'll be back at any minute. But minute after minute goes by, and he isn't back. They don't mean what they say. The truth is, we just don't know. And Gloria, I said, Salim has to be somewhere. It's a mystery. I'm working on it, in my brain. Your brain? Aunt Gloria repeated. She smiled at me. It reminded me of the way Mum smiled at me the time I asked her about miracle cures and whether I could get one for my syndrome if I prayed hard enough. Like Mum's then, Aunt Gloria's lips turned up, but at the same time a tear came down her cheek. She took my hand and rubbed my knuckles, which is a strange thing to do, and started my other hand flapping. Sometimes I think there's more in that brain of yours, Ted, than the rest of ours put together. If brains alone could bring Salim back, yours would do it. Then Aunt Gloria got up from the sofa and went upstairs to Kat's room, which was where she was sleeping. I didn't want to run into Mum in case she asked me about Kat again, and I would have to tell the Tiffany lie. So I went where I always go when I want to do my t favorite, two favourite things, think and watch the weather, the back garden. The shirts were still flapping on the line. They'd been up for three days. Mum had forgotten about them. I touched them. They were damp from the light rain we'd had that morning. I paced the lawn to check if I'd had a, to check it hadn't grown or shrunk. Twelve and a half strides wide and seven across, the same as last week. Then I realised when I got a, grew taller and my legs longer, the number of strides would decrease. It was another example of how things can change depending on how you look at them. I was back with the water going down the plug hole in different directions, depending on which hemisphere you were in. The London eye revolving in different directions depending on which side of the river you were on, worms being male and female, satellites moving and staying still. Something flickered in my brain. It was a pattern. Two things that looked alike. Something that looked like one thing, but was really another thing. I pinched my for right forearm to make the pattern stay, but it didn't. It vanished before I could fix it, before I could find out what it was. I looked up at the sky. Thin strata cloud, white and harmless, floated in the southeast. But to the northwest, in the heart of the city, a cumulus cloud was in formation. I stared as vapour collected and imagined how the particles of water were swirling around in a central funnel, making it into a threatening shaft. It might or might not bring rain. It was moving this way over the skyline. Its heavy, bulbous shape billowed out as rising air currents added to its mass. I thought of Cat out there, somewhere in the city, under the growing cumulus cloud, on the trail of a strange man who sold us the ticket, and I knew what I had to do. I got the phone in Mum and Dad's bedroom, with nobody noticing. I dialed Frontline Security again. Frontline security, came the same female voice after the music and record the recorded announcement. Hello, I said. Hello, she said. Can I help you? Hmm, I said. Sorry, she said. Didn't catch that. Uh, I said. You're just a kid, aren't you? I'm 12 years old, I said. Well, she said. I'm just a temp. There was silence. I thought hard. Have you got the right number? She asked. Yes. So who are you looking for? A man, I said. A man? A man with a stubbly chin. She laughed loudly. Sounds like Christy. He's the only one here who never shaves properly. You're the second person who's been after him today. I'll tell you what I told her. He's not here. Not here? I'm the only one here today. Oh. I man the phone. I'm manning the phone, so to speak. She laughs some more down the phone. I didn't understand the joke, but I did what Mr Shepherd told me to do and laughed as well. First, it's a young girl who's looking for a friend of her older brother. She's got a picture of him, but she doesn't know what he's called. And she's desperate because he's left his asthma inhaler in her house. 
Now it's a kid looking for a man with a stubbly chin. Well, honey, I tell you what, I told the girl. It's no skin off my teeth. I pictured the pink flesh around her molars. Christie's with the other guys and girls. They're all on the same job this week. Down Owls Court at the Motorcycle and Scooter Show. Owls Court? The big expedition hall. If you find Christie there, don't say I told you, will you? No, I said, but she'd already hung up. You can live a whole life, 20 years and 188 days, or 4,571 days, not forgetting the three extra days for leap years, and not tell a single lie. Then, on day 4,572, you tell two. The first lie I told was about the compass that wasn't really lost. The second lie was the note I wrote and left by the phone. It said, Dear Mum, we have gone swimming to get some exercise. Ted. Next, I took 15 one pound coins from the treasure chest I have had since I was five. I went to the end of the landing and listened. Mum and Rashid were downstairs in the kitchen again. They were talking quietly. The house was calm. I crept down the stairs. I headed for the front door. It, I opened it, stepped out into the sunshine and paused. Was this the right thing to do? What if Mum found the note and didn't believe it? What if I didn't find Cat in Earl's Court Exhibition Centre? What if I didn't find Earl's Court at all? What if I didn't even make it to our local underground station? But cat, astrophy, cat, cataclysm, cat, a log of disasters by mean, my mean, mad sister wasn't going to leave me behind, not when so much was at stake. I inched the door shut. I headed through our postage stamp front garden. I closed the gate behind me and walked out onto the pavement and down the road. Okay, so I'd like you to have a little think and I'd like you to think about that. Is that the right choice? Will Ted and will Ted find Cat? Will he manage to get there? And a bit of a change in Ted's character here. We're seeing him lie for the first time, okay? So think about some of the other changes maybe we'll see in Ted over the coming chapters.